everyone. I will give everybody just another minute to get logged in, but I just wanted to say hello and test uh, my audio and my visuals. So if you can see my screen, you should see a uh, title slide with planning your spring fundraiser and some pretty pink flowers on it. Um, and you can hear me talking right now. If you could just type yes into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel, that would be a huge help just so that I know you can all hear me. Excellent, thank you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna put myself on mute for here for just another second and then we will get started. All right, thank you everybody for joining me today for our webinar on planning your spring fundraiser uh, for 2021. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. I've been with the company since 2016 and before that I spent uh, the majority of my career working for nonprofits. so I have helped create a spring fundraiser or two in my time and hopefully I can bring that experience today uh, to help you get some idea of where to start planning your spring fundraiser. Here's a look at today's agenda. Um, I'm gonna try my darndest to keep this to 30 minutes and then leave time at the end for a live Q&A. Um, so if you have a question that you think of while I'm presenting, just go ahead and type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel and we'll make sure that we have time to get to everybody's questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and just to let you know, we are recording this webinar um, and you'll all have access to uh, the slides and the recording so that if you need to step out or you need to leave early, uh, you will still have access to all of the content we're going to be talking through uh, today. Um, so I really wanted to start off this webinar by talking about the context of spring fundraising in 2021. So last year, 2020, uh, spring fundraising was honestly a complete chaotic mess um, because of coronavirus. Um, I had had a whole docket of happy spring fundraising content plans, and that all got replaced with like endlessly talking about fundraising in the time of COVID and how to quickly move your fundraiser online. Um, almost every spring fundraiser that got planned last year was upended. Um, as we went into lockdown, states put shelter in place orders into effect, and the whole situation just changed almost completely overnight. Uh, spring fundraising is often about getting outside, gathering to enjoy the warm weather, there are spring galas, um, and those either had to be canceled, postponed, or completely reimagined. Um, and pretty much everybody was on the struggle bus. Um, lots of nonprofits that rely on gathering people uh, together as part of their or operations, like theaters and museums uh, were unable to do so. And then the organizations that were providing direct aid to people like food, get, food banks were racing to keep up with the demand. And then the nonprofits that were not directly impacted, at least mission-wise and operations-wise by COVID, um, still were impacted and struggled with whether or not it was okay to fundraise during a time when so much was happening and people were losing their jobs. Um, and in the midst of all of this, if that wasn't enough, a lot of people, uh, most nonprofits, transitioned into working from home for the first time ever for a lot of people. So there was just a lot of chaos last spring, um, which brings us to 2020. Um, and I wanted to mention all of that so that we can talk about where we are now, which is in a much better place in 2021. Um, people are getting vaccinated slowly but surely, um, but it is still a, a good recommendation and a best practice to keep things virtual just for safety purposes. Um, some states are allowing you to gather in limited amounts, but uh, we definitely recommend keeping it virtual for the spring, just so that if there is another spike in rates, and in some areas there is a spike, um, that you don't have to cancel your live event again. Um, and the good news is that none of this is a surprise to us this year. We can all draw on our experiences and all the adapting that we had to do on the fly in 2020. Um, and we are prepared for a spring fundraiser that is going to be online. And we can also take a look at what worked for us last spring and what didn't work for us last spring and make informed decisions about our fundraising in 2021. Um, and we are still in a recession, um, but it is slowly getting better. And charitable giving is actually going really strongly right now. 
Um, so when I was preparing for this webinar, I dug into the Association of Fundraising Professionals Fundraising Effectiveness Reports um, for the first, second, and third quarters of 2020. Uh, Q4 was just not available when I was prepping for this webinar. And I just wanted to go over some key things that happened in 2020 because, as we all know, it was a very unusual year and it sort of brings us to where we are now. Um, so small donors, meaning individuals that gave an amount under $200, $150 increased a lot in 2020, um, almost by 20%, which is pretty significant. So this demographic uh, maybe deserves some extra love and attention that we normally reserve for our bigger donors. Um, new donors also increased by 6%, which is exciting, and overall giving is up. Um, there was a dip in the first quarter of 2020 when things seemed very unstable and precarious, but it didn't take long to, uh, to recover, and and it actually increased from there. Giving is actually the strongest it's been in five years, which is amazing. Um, one thing that is a bummer is that donor retention is still low. It's not actually lower than it was in 2019, but it is still pretty low. So that's something that needs to be a focus in 2021, especially when you look at that information in concert with the fact that we have more new donors. Donor retention really just needs to be a focus in 2021. Um, and the one thing that I thought was really interesting is that um, in 2020, donors spread out their gifts. So instead of funneling all of the charitable giving that they had to give into one organization that they passionately support, they were giving lots to, they're giving smaller amounts to lots of organizations. So they weren't channeling everything into one organization as much as we've seen in the past, but they were trying to spread it around a bit more, which is something new that I thought was interesting to see. So with all of that in mind, there are some things that we recommend uh, focusing on for your spring fundraiser. Um, the first is obviously retention um, and making a specific intentional effort to recapture the donors from last year so you can bring them back and keep them in the fold. Um, some segments that you may want to pay att extra attention to are any Giving Tuesday or Giving Tuesday Now donors. Um, just as a reminder, Giving Tuesday Now was on May 5th last year. It was a Giving Tuesday event that was specifically focused on um, COVID relief. And so that was an interesting thing about 2020 as well, is that we actually had two Giving Tuesdays. Um, and also just, you know, following up with any first-time donors um, that you got from 2020. Um, and you do have a retention report in your Mighty Cause dashboard. I just wanted to remind everybody that you can use to identify donors that have not yet been retained so that you can specifically target them for outreach. Um, Next up, recurring donations. Those are always really important, and I think we all learned last year just how important they are. They bring sustainable, dependable revenue to your organization, and they can really carry you through a crisis. These donors are really key. They are the foundation upon which uh, sustainable nonprofits are built. Um, so thinking about how to, how to get more recurring donations, building that recurring support is really going to be important in 2021. Um, and that's also a, a way that you can engage those smaller donors that we were talking about um, is by asking them to make their small gift that they've made into a monthly recurring donation. And messaging is also going to be really important in 2021. Um, people have been dealing with a lot of doom and gloom for the past year. People are tired, they are weary. Uh, so the spring campaign is an opportunity to have a thoughtful, hopeful, uplifting message and move away from a lot of the emergency messaging that we've seen, um, you know, been used pretty heavily in 2020 and even the beginning of 2021. Um, so spring, fundraiser is really an opportunity to get a little bit lighter with your fundraising. Um, so next I want to talk about goal setting. That's always the foundation of most campaigns is setting goals for it. Um, most of us already know what a SMART goal is and we use them regularly, but it never hurts to, to get a reminder, especially when you're starting to plan a campaign. Um, SMART uh, stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time bound. Um, when we're thinking about our goals, you want things that are specific, like increasing recurring donations, um, getting your donor retention rate up. 
Uh, things that are vague, like get more donations or engage more donors, um, they're really hard to quantify, so that makes them hard to achieve. Um, there's really no path to achieving that, and there's a lot of interpretations of what success could be, so making the goals specific will help you make sure that your goals can be easily achieved and you can see a path to achieving them. Um, which brings us to M, um, which stands for measurable. Um, when you're setting goals, you want to identify key performance indicators or KPIs um, that will help you see if you've succeeded. Um, so a good example of a KPI is your donor retention rate. It's a hard number and it's something that you can measure and quantify very easily. Um, so you want your goals to also be attainable. Um, one of the ways to, to look for an attainable goal or to set an attainable goal is to look at your past performance at last spring or in your last campaign and aim to just bump that up, um, but don't set goals that are too ambitious for you to realistically achieve. Um, you're most likely not going to double your amount raised last spring um, unless something really extraordinary happens. So just keep your goals realistic so that you're more likely, more likely to achieve them. Um, and finally, R and T relevant in time bound. Uh, the time bound part is usually built right into the campaign because you're setting a deadline um, and your campaign will end at some point. Um, but just make sure that the goals you're setting for this campaign are tied to your overall 2021 goals for your fundraising and relevant to your needs right now. Um, and in terms of th making things time bound, one thing that you can consider is um, setting sort of mini goals within your campaign, like hitting a certain donation rate by X number of days or weeks into your campaign. Okay, so here are some examples of goals that are really great for a spring campaign. Um, increasing average gift size is an excellent goal because it's very specific and measurable, and it'll also help boost your total amount raised in most cases. Um, you can set out to achieve that increase, but increase by using um, outreach, and you can also tweak the suggested donation amounts a bit to bump up your average gift size. Um, so that's uh, something we'll talk about in just a bit, but when people are checking out, and they're choosing the amount that they want to give. Um, it seems like such a small thing, but just increasing those amounts a little bit can really make a difference because you're suggesting it to people, it's right there, it's just the click of a button, and it kind of reframes what, uh, what you're looking for from them. So tweaking those suggested amounts in your uh, donation flow is really important. Um, Getting new recurring donations is another excellent goal. You can see how many you currently have right in your donations report and just aim to boost that. So if you currently have 20 recurring donations or recurring donors, set a goal to increase that to 30 or whatever you feel comfortable with with your spring campaign. Um, and donor retention, again, is always an important goal use your donor retention report and the metrics on your overview screen, which you can customize and set a goal to increase that number um, by a couple of percentage points. Like obviously 10% is a lot to aim for, but uh, two or 3% in an increase is a really reasonable goal that you could set for yourself. Um, so when you have your goal set, it's time to refresh your Mighty Cause profile. Um, this is a little bit of a technical slide, I apologize, but this stuff is important, so I do want to mention it to you. Um, your donation levels and descriptions, as we talked about, are super important. They catch donors exactly when they're trying to decide how much to give, so make sure that those are in line with your spring campaign and your goals. Um, at the start of a new campaign, take a look at your checkout flow and just make sure that your thank you page and your receipt message are up to date. Um, this is where a lot of orgs sometimes can forget that they have old messaging or old information or they didn't update it from Giving Tuesday. Um, so just take a look at all of that, including your data co collection and your dedications and designations. Just make sure everything is as you want it in your checkout flow. Um, <clears throat> refreshing your profile, your logo, your images, and your story will help you get prepped for your spring campaign. Um, something that you can consider is sort of swapping out the images just so your page is fresh and maybe adding some more spring-like imagery with people outside or things outside just to sort of give it a, a quick refresh um, and just make sure that you're wiping out any Giving Tuesday or end of year um, language or imagery because you want your page to feel up to date. Um, and this isn't vital, but it's also a really great time to just take a look at who has admin access to your profile and do some spring cleaning. Um, add anyone new that might need access to your, your profile for your campaign and just take a minute and remove anybody who no longer needs access 
else, um, it's always a good idea to do that as you're getting ready for a new campaign. And then finally, take some time to check your EFT and org info and just make sure everything is up to date. These are really simple steps that you can take um, that will help set you up for success in your campaign. Okay, so now we're going to move into how to pick a theme for your spring campaign. So the first thing, which I'm hoping you'll all do as part of your goal setting process, is to examine your organization's needs for spring 2021, because that's what ends up guiding your campaign in many cases. Um, do you have any particular programs or services or special funds that need some funding right now, or any aspects of your work that are just particularly relevant in the spring? Um, for instance, when I was working in fundraising for an animal shelter, um, and when I worked in animal shelters in general, it was a it was a long portion of my career, um, spring was always kind of a no-brainer for our fundraiser because it's kitten season, um, which meant that we often highlighted our foster program as part of our spring fundraiser or even as a focus of our fundraiser. Um, it helped us keep, stay, keep our foster program funded and buy supplies for kittens when we were bombarded with underage kittens and pregnant mom cats, and it also highlighted all the work that our organization did to help these kittens and cats and provide a safe place for them until they were old enough to be adopted. So something like that can really be an easy win for your organization and there's an obvious angle sometimes just in a particular program or service that your organization uh, provides. Um, also, think about whether you have any ongoing need, needs for COVID-19. There are certainly a lot of orgs still affected, so just, you know, re regather your thoughts and find out what you need and plug that into your spring campaign. Um, be sure to also think about any special dates coming up, like an anniversary, a milestone, um, and sometimes awareness months or holidays can help you come up with a, an angle that works for you. Um, as another example, when I worked for an organization that uh, worked to help animals in puppy mills, dogs in puppy mills, we used Mother's Day to fundraise and raise awareness for that cause because we were basically trying to help uh, the mothers in the the puppy mills and so that kind of holiday really worked out for us and we were able to leverage that holiday to bring attention and awareness and also in much needed funding in for that cause um, so just keep an eye out for any special dates um, there are a lot of like goofy holidays and there's plenty of awareness months there's several pretty much every month of the calendar year um, so you can just sort of google special dates calendars and see if there's anything that might fit in When you're picking a theme, it's also really helpful to review your past campaigns and see what worked and what maybe didn't work so well. Um, so did you have any notable or very successful campaigns in the past? Um, any bright spots that just worked really beautifully for your organization? Um, what made them so successful? Was it something that um, you, can camp you can replicate this spring with your campaign or improve on or expand on? Um, is there a campaign format that has worked well for your organization? Um, for instance, if you have always done charity walks in the spring and that's been hugely successful, su successful for you, um, can you bring that online and just do a virtual charity walk? Um, and also take a look at what didn't work as well, um, and either in terms of hitting your fundraising goals or just being hard to manage. Sometimes things are successful, but they're a little unwieldy behind the scenes. Um, and when you use this kind of process of elimination, um, you're usually able to whittle down the options and find a theme or a format for your fundraiser that will really work for you. Um, another thing to think about in the little uh, thought bubble up there is capacity. Um, a lot of nonprofits are still working remotely, um, still not able to gather, and sometimes, you know, some people may have been furloughed, or you may be working with a skeleton crew or just have rotating schedules. Um, so also just consider your capacity. You may need to scale down this year based on the human resources that you have available and the situation that your nonprofit may be in. So to help you find your spring fundraiser, there's basically three formats on Mighty Cause that you can choose from, and we're going to go through them one by one. Um, and by the time you're done with this webinar, you should be able to take a look at the options and decide which format within our platform works best to fit your needs. So these are the 
three basic formats for a fundraiser on Mighty Cause. Um, the first is a fundraiser, which is really the simplest option. It's a one page campaign where you set a goal um, and a focus and you fundraise. Um, in most cases, this is a fundraiser that you run yourself as the nonprofit, but it's also something that um, peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers can use as well. Like when a, a supporter wants to run a birthday fundraiser for your um, organization, um, it, that would also be called a fundraiser. But in terms of uh, this format, we're really talking about a campaign with one page that is being managed uh, by your nonprofit. Um, teams are organized peer-to-peer -peer campaigns, uh, meaning that you have other people, your supporters, fundraising on your behalf and benefiting your organization. Um, a team is a group of peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers that you organize, so you have to recruit the people to fundraise for you and get them signed up. And then the team as a whole has a main page with a leaderboard where you can talk a little bit about the campaign um, and you'll be able to see who's members, who's, who's in the campaign. And then um, each team member has their own fundraising page that they'll share with their social network and they all work together to uh, hit a collective fundraising goal that's listed on the team's page. Um, and finally, events are the next step up from teams. Um, they're a little bit more complex, um, and that's because they bring together individual peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers and teams of fundraisers together to fundraise collaboratively and competitively. Um, you can also add ticketing and registration with our events product. Um, so events are a pretty robust, complex product um, that really lets you do a, a more sophisticated, involved fundraiser. So I'm a visual learner and sometimes I can find that kind of stuff really confusing to say and explain to people. So I tried to break it out into graphics for you. Um, so in a fundraiser, um, you have your nonprofit and you're just talking directly to your donors. It's pretty simple. Um, your nonprofit arrow donors. It's There's no in, middleman or anything in between that. And with teams, you're also talking directly to your supporters because they can certainly donate to your team page, but you also have the added element of a team of peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers soliciting donations from their social network, from their friends, their family members, their colleagues, and so on. Um, so this is why they're really great for donor acquisition, um, because you have a different source of people who are coming to make donations. Um, so that's a sort of easy visual uh, representation of how fundraisers and teams differ from one, one another. So this may look a little bit scary and, and intense. That wasn't my intention. Um, events are really not scary, um, but the product did actually need its own slide. Um, so with an event, your nonprofit sets up the events website on Mighty Cause. And we are saying it's a website because there are multiple different pages. Um, so with an event, you have your teams and you have individual fundraisers who are asking for donations. Um, so you'll have a leaderboard that's organized into teams and individual fundraisers so that people can easily find them and they can also find them through the donation flow and choose who they want if they don't go to an individual's actual page to make a donation. So it's more complex and it's also a bigger opportunity for donor acquisition because you have them coming in through even more channels than you do with teams. And again, you can add registration and ticket sales into the mix here through our Eventbrite integration. Um, and I didn't have the space for it, but you can also have the option uh, for something called a general fund through your event website, um, which enables donors to just make a straight donation to your nonprofit that's not attributed to any particular fundraiser or team um, that participating in your event. So if you choose, you can also have a direct route to your supporters as well. Um, so you really have donations coming in from three sources instead of just one or instead of just two. It's a much more complex um, kind of fundraiser and it's definitely focused on individuals, like basically creating an army of fundraisers who are going to go out and ask people to make a contribution.
So a fundraiser um, is the right choice for you if you're really not interested in running a peer-to-peer -peer campaign this time around and you just want to keep things simple. Um, and it also makes a lot of sense if you want to focus in on a particular message or issue and just stay in control of the fundraising rather than getting people to fundraise for you because you do lose a, lose a, lose a little bit of control with peer-to-peer -peer because people are talking about your cause instead of you talking directly to your supporters about the cause. Um, and donor acquisition is fantastic, but oftentimes um, it's just not a focus. So um, a fundraiser would be a better choice if you're not looking to bring in a, a bulk of new new donors and you're just looking to engage uh, the people who are already in your network and maybe bring in a handful of new donors. Um, and teams and events can be a lot of work. Um, so a fundraiser is a great choice if you just don't have the capacity right now to recruit fundraisers and manage them through a team or event. Um, it's easier in most cases just to raise money by yourselves without uh, pulling peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers in. Um, and just as a side note, um, a lot of organizations, if they really want to keep it simple, um, will literally just use their organization profile on Mighty Cause as their fundraising page, which is also an option if you want to it, it, if you want to do it that way instead setting, instead of setting up a different campaign. Um, we do have pages that are set up specifically for that purpose and it's very easy to set one up. But if you're looking for as simple as humanly possible, um, you can use your organization profile as your main fundraising page. And a lot of um, organizations who participate in giving events on our platform will choose to do that as well. So a team is the right choice for you if you want to incorporate peer-to-peer -peer into your spring campaign, but you don't think you'll need um, the space to accommodate teams of people and you mostly anticipate individuals who will want to fundraise for you. Um, basically, a team is a team by itself, an event is teams of teams, if that makes any more sense to you. Um, and teams are great if you want to add a little competition because you've got a leaderboard where you're, you can rank people based on how much they've raised or how many donors they've brought in. You have the choice to choose either of those. And you can also keep it alphabetical if you don't want competition, but a team page is really designed to start some friendly competition. Um, and you can also offer incentives to the winners to uh, A, get people on board, and B, keep the competition going and keep them motivated to fundraise. Um, again, teams and events are all about donor acquisition. So if donor acquisition is your goal, teams are fantastic. Um, there's a little fun fact on this slide uh, that teams and events raise on average 30% uh, more than standalone fundraising pages. Um, and the reason for that is basically that there's power in numbers. You're getting more uh, boots on the ground and you're also uh, touching more people because you have more people involved. Um, and finally, teams are a great choice if you don't have a need for registration or tickets because those are two key components of our events product. So who are events good for? Um, so our events product was really designed with uh, certain things in mind, like 5Ks, charity walks. Um, you can even run your own giving day. Um, like for instance, if Giving Tuesday Now was really successful for you last May, uh, you can actually run your own similar fundraiser um, on our events product. Um, any event where you're gathering lots of people the events product is great for. Although again, this year, this should all be done virtually. We don't recommend um, gathering people in person um, just for safety reasons. Um, events are big. So if you have a lot of people you know will want to participate, if you have a fairly robust network of people, then you'll want a big robust product like events where you have tools that you can use to stay organized and manage your participants. Um, and if you know that you're going to have individual fundraisers and teams, um, like for instance, if you have a dedicated group of people who like to fundraise for you, and you also maybe have some local companies or your board of directors and they want to fundraise together, then uh, it's a really perfect product choice for you. And if you want to sell tickets or have a registration process for your participants, then you'll need to choose an event because it's the only product where we offer those capabilities. So if ticketing and registration is something that you want, you will need to choose events. Um, events are usually about competition and taking things bigger. So if you want to get people competing to raise the most money and you're looking for more fundraisers, more sponsors, more donors, events is likely the product that you'll want to use for your spring fundraiser. 
And if you want some information, uh, inspiration and you're looking for ideas for your fundraiser, if you're really stuck or you just want to, you know, get some ideas that to get those creative juices flowing, um, we will be having an entire webinar with nothing but fundraising ideas. So be sure to register for that. It's on March 23rd at 3 p.m. and we can really dig into sharing ideas with you. Um, so that's basically part two of this webinar. Um, you can register on the uh, in the Mighty Cause Resource Center. We have a webinar library that has a schedule of all of our upcoming webinars and that's mightycause.com slash guide slash webinars um, and we have all of our upcoming webinars listed there so you can take a look um, if, if and see if there's any that you want to register for it's definitely if you're looking to plan your spring fundraiser um, that's a great I would recommend signing up for this one um, and there's also some recorded webinars there as well so there's some a backlog of webinars that we've done that you can check out um, we've had some other uh, fundraising ideas webinars that you uh, may find helpful all right, so thank you guys for sticking with me and I just have to give myself a little pat on the back. It is 3.29 Eastern time, so I kept that to uh, almost 30 minutes exactly. Um, so I do wanna um, open the floor up to questions now. Um, so I'm just gonna take a look if there's anything here. Um, let's see. Can you set a campaign specifically for recurring donations? Abby is asking that. Um, so not specifically on our platform we are working to some changes where that may be possible in the future uh, but right now we don't actually like you you can't say no <laughs> to a one-time donation um, and but it's very easy to set up a recurring donation you just click a, a box while you're checking out um, and you can also just use your messaging to um, you know, reinforce that you're looking for recurring donations. So we don't have a tool because we don't want you to say no to a, a, a one-time donation. Um, but you, you would want to just basically tailor your messaging to recurring donations. And you can also use your suggested donation amounts um, to share some messaging like, hey, $20 per month helps us do X, Y, and Z um, when you're writing the descriptions, and that can reinforce that you're looking for recurring donations. Um, but we, we don't want to put you in a position where um, somebody comes to make a one-time donation and they can't do that. So there's no setting that or switch you can flip in Mighty Cause that will uh, be specifically just only looking for recurring donations, but definitely you can use the messaging on your, your fundraising page, in your emails, and your communications with donors to let them know that you're really trying to get uh, recurring donations. And I also recommend you know, doing some specific outreach saying, hey, uh, you gave to us $25 in our last campaign. Can you uh, give us $25 on a recurring basis for our new campaign? Um, so that kind of thing can be really helpful when you're trying to run a recurring giving campaign. Um, and just as a note, we did actually do a couple of webinars on running a recurring giving campaign. Um, those are in our webinar library. So be sure to check those out if you're looking to do a recurring giving campaign um, because we do have a lot of information about that. Um, okay, it looks like a few of you had issues with the sound. Um, I do apologize for that. I haven't gotten any notifications from GoToWebinar, um, but um, I will certainly send out the recording and see if we can fix any issues that people were having with the audio. I apologize for that. Um, let's see. Can you copy that org profi profile campaign to your website or your Facebook Facebook page? Um, so I'm not entirely sure what that um, what what you you mean there. So you can always email me and let me know um, what that question like where you're specifically looking to put the. Um, the profile, we do have some tools that you can embed on your website. Um, you can embed our donation widget, and if you are you have an advanced subscription, you can actually embed an entire donation form on your website. So we do have some embeddable tools that you can use so that people can make a donation through your website. Unfortunately, Facebook has sort of closed their API uh, to integrations uh, unless you have like a tremendous number of followers. So um, most of our nonprofits do not meet that threshold. Um, some of them are grandfathered into having their widget, our widget on their website, um, but you definitely can embed some uh, some tools on your website so that people don't have to leave your website to make a donation. Um, I would recommend going to support.mightycause.com um, and learning more about those tools, and I'm also happy to help you out if you wanted to get in touch with me at lynda.mightycause.com. 
Um, what are the keys to a successful peer-to-peer -peer campaign? How do you get those individuals motivated to talk about your organization for you? Um, that's a question from James. That's a fantastic question. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, we have a lot of content on this, but really the key is to sort of tap into those people who are already in your nonprofit circle, who attend your events, who are really invested in your organization. So when you're thinking about dipping your toe into peer-to-peer -peer for the first time, um, um, tap your board, your board of directors, um, tap your volunteers and let them know what you're, you're asking of them to do because those are the, the biggest advocates for your organization as the people who are already invested. And then you just want to extend outward. Um, a lot of organizations, if they're really looking to get a robust peer-to-peer -peer campaign going, will add some prizes. They don't need to be particularly fancy or expensive. They can be things you already have on hand, like stickers or t-shirts, and saying that everybody who signs up to fundraise for us will get a sticker for their car, a bumper sticker or a keychain. Little things like that can really incentivize people. Um, and one thing I do want to mention is that we do have a tool called Fundraise or templates um, where you can actually pre-fill some of the information on the fundraiser page which is a really great tool to get people in the door um, because you can they don't have to really do much at all they just have to sign up for an account and sign up to fundraise for you so you can also utilize fundraiser templates and be like hey this is super easy um, come create a fundraiser for us and then here's what you have to do um, but really it just starts with um, having that inner circle uh, get involved. Your board of directors, your volunteers, sometimes your staff. Um, getting a little staff peer-to-peer -peer fundraising can uh, can help um, and just sort of think think of who's close to you already and who already shows up to support your organization every day. Um, so that's really the key is sort of tapping into your most motivated, enthusiastic supporters. Um, and then obviously just thinking about incentives and keeping them motivated. You want to stay in contact with them as they're running their fundraisers and be available to answer any questions they have. All right, a question from Veronica. Are there any integrations with Mighty Cause to track miles walked for a virtual walkathon type event? Um, so that's a great question. We don't have anything like that right now, um, but please stay tuned. Uh, we are we do have some things that are hopefully coming down the pipeline that will be geared toward that. I don't have any sort of uh, date for that, um, but you would just want to use the tools we currently have, like five dollars to support me for you know half a mile, uh, and you can sort of set that structure up for them so that you know what each donation kind of denotes, even though we don't have that the pledges available at this time, but do stay tuned. We are working on something along those lines. All right, so this is a question from Tom. Uh, you mentioned something about setting up receipts. Can you tell me more about how the donor gets the receipt? Is it an automated response? Just wanted to clarify. Uh, so that's a really great question, Tom. Uh, so in your checkout flow on Mighty Cause, if you go to your dashboard on your organization profile, um, you'll have a, uh, you'll have a, little tab that's called fundraising and there's a menu underneath there. You can go to checkout flow um, and then go to post checkout and you have two options there. You can have a thank you page which will show when people complete their donation and then you have a, a message that you can include on the receipt. So receiving at Mighty Cause basically works like this. Um, all don donations are processed through the Mighty Cause Charitable Foundation, which is a donor advised fund. So when they make their donation to your Mighty Cause page, they are advising the Charitable Foundation that they would like the, the funding to go to you. Um, and so they get a receipt from the Mighty Cause Charitable Foundation, and that is the reason that DAF is set up uh, so that we can issue receipting. So that happens automatically as soon as they complete their donation. And what I was talking about in terms of receipt customization is that you can add a message onto that receipt. So basically what that does is it acknowledges your donor um, automatically. So you can set that up through your checkout flow and then go to post checkout um, and then you'll be able to automatically acknowledge your donors. They get their receipt automatically. We handle that. You don't need to worry about that. Um, and that also kind of buys you a little bit of time because once they've made their donation, they are very quickly acknowledged by your organization because you included that thank you message and then you can follow up with a more comprehensive thank you. But yeah, that's automated through Mighty Cause. All customers on Mighty Cause have uh, access to that. Um, so please make sure you're using that custom message. It's a big deal and it gets you, um, you know, it buys you some time when you're thinking about acknowledging donors. Um, let's see. 
A question from Sylvia, um, will this information be accessible on your website anywhere or via email? Yeah, so uh, we are recording this right now, so I will make sure that you all get the um, the recording and the slides. It may be Monday because I'm actually out at the office tomorrow, um, but you'll have access to the uh, slides and the recording as well. And then we will have that housed in our webinar library, um, which you can find by going to mightycause.com slash guide, um, and then just click on webinars, and we have all of our past webinars um, uploaded there so you can access them and it'll kind of be uh, it in that on that page in perpetuity um, let's see here's a question from Ryan um, are the funds that come through event ticket sales still considered a donation um, so we do um, ticketing through our Eventbrite integration so as long as you have everything set up correctly on Eventbrite um, and it is a full integration so we are talking to Eventbrite it's not just like we you know port in some information from Eventbrite like it, we're talking to Eventbrite through their API um, as long as you have everything set up on um, on uh, Eventbrite, you should it should be you know a donation, but you also want to be careful because obviously no goods or services can be exchanged for a charitable donation. So it kind of also depends on like are you selling you know swag bags or t-shirts or anything along those lines. So that's um, kind of a bigger question. Um, but yeah, I mean as long as you have everything set up on the Eventbrite side, um, it should be a, a charitable donation. You know, but check with your your tax people just to make sure that it qualifies as a charitable donation. Every every payment that's processed on Mighty Cause um, for your nonprofit is a charitable donation that is tax deductible. Um, so I hope that helps, but yeah, it's through our Eventbrite integration. So um, check out Eventbrite's tools um, and make sure that you have everything set up and that it's noted that you are a nonprofit organization in Eventbrite. All right, so um, this is from Mona. Are the fees based on which campaign method is used, um, fundraiser versus teams versus events? Um, so it, it's kind of variable depending on the plan that your nonprofit has. Um, so take a look at what your plan is right now um, because you know there is some variance based on whether you have been with us for a while and you're using our basic Mighty Cause plan, whether you have an advanced subscription, whether you're using our essentials tools, um, so you can go to mightycost.com slash pricing and see, um, you know, what the prices for various things are, uh, but it really does depend on, you know, where we did make some changes to our pricing recently, um, but just go to mightycost.com slash pricing. Um, if you've been with us for a while, then don't worry about it, but you can find information there about what's included in the various subscriptions. And if you are interested in upgrading to advanced, because that does give you access to more tools, um, you can, you can set up a demo and talk to one of our representatives about um, setting up an advanced subscription. Okay, uh, this is a comment from Eve. Please say your name slowly when giving your contacts. Um, so it's Linda, L-I-N-D-A, at mightycause.com. Um, so if you'd like to email me, that's L-I-N-D-A, at mightycause.com. I'm always available to you. And if you have any questions that are on the more technical side, you can always reach out to our support team at support at mightycause.com. And I am a fast talker. I apologize for that. Um, let's see. This is a question from Donald again. Um, your connection with Bonfire, is there a sticker or keychain program that you do together? Um, at this point, no, we don't have any like connection beyond uh, Bonfire. Um, we did have a guest post from them, um, so we don't have any formal partnerships regarding, you know, setting up, uh, you know, swag, like keychains, stickers, and that kind of stuff. Um, so unfortunately, no, we don't have anything set up on that end, um, but we did have a Bob Bonfire write a guest post for us about t-shirts um, on our blog, um, and certainly if you have any uh, community connections, um, I would look into those for getting those things printed, but we, we don't have the capacity to uh, manage sort of sending things out to people like we can't send out a t-shirt on your behalf so you would need to look into a third party to manage those for you let's see um, this is a question from I'm sorry if I'm butchering this Rayshawn 
Lewis, um, do we get contact information from donors? Yes, so that is one of the things that we are definitely sure to do is that you have access to all of your donor information. We don't have access to anything that you don't um, and you own it 100%. So we don't, we don't hold it hostage from you. Uh, we don't make you, uh, you know, pay for anything to access it. It is all available in your donation report. You just have to sign up for an account with Mighty Cause um, and it's in your donation report. You can download all of their information, their address, um, you just have to make sure that you are collecting their address. Um, so make sure that, that you're opted into that in your checkout flow section. Um, but any questions they answered, if you wanted to find out what company they work for, um, you definitely have access to every piece of data that we collect from donors. Um, and I also just wanted to piggyback off of that and say that we don't sell your donor information, we don't utilize your donor information, and we do not contact them outside of, you know, giving them their receipt, letting them know that, hey, your recurring donation has a card that's about to expire. Um, we really only send them transactional emails or things that are related to a donation. We don't ever market to them. So that's another thing that's important to know about Mighty Cause because with Facebook, they are using your donor information and you have limited access to it. So on Mighty Cause, you have access to it all. You don't have, uh, we don't have anything that you don't have when it comes to your donors. And you have, do have access to some custom data collection through your checkout flow, um, which is really cool. So you can collect the information that's most important to your organization. Let's see, um, some donation sites take a percentage of the donation. Is there a fee or a percentage taken? Um, so yeah, we do still operate from the platform fee models, but there is a lot of um, flexibility in that. So we do have some different models uh, where you know the donor can pick up the uh, platform fee for you. Um, and we have different, uh, different plans available. So if you'd like to look into the different payment options, you can certainly contact our team at support at mightycause.com and talk about what works best for you and what's available. Um, but yet we do still, um, in most cases, collect platform fees, but there are different plans available and there's some variance just based on the options that Mighty Cause users use on, on your end. Um, so you can contact support at mightycause.com if you wanted to, uh, you know, find out more specifically, you know, if you have something set up, um, what and you, you'll be able to see this so I just want to make that totally clear um, that when you get your disbursement report and also on your donation report you can see the breakdown of absolutely everything there's no there's complete transparency from us it's all in your reporting and uh, if you have specific questions about your plan and what you're currently on or if you're not on a plan currently um, contact support at mightycause.com and they will help you out let's see um, how do you use the Facebook and Instagram galleries? That's a question from Kathy. Um, so they should be as, as simple as just sort of connecting your Facebook page or your Instagram account. Um, there can be some, some tricky uh, sort of things with both of those um, APIs. So if you're having a, a problem connecting your Instagram account, um, contact our support team um, as well as your, your Facebook account because there are some funny things that can happen on Facebook's end. Um, Facebook obviously owns Instagram, so there are some funky things that can happen that are kind of specific to their APIs, um, but just contact our support team if you're not able to easily set those up or you're getting an error message. It should be easy, um, but sometimes some weird things about the accounts themselves and the way that the integration works can throw that off, but our our support team will help help you get that sorted out so that you can connect those. All right, this is the last question from Sharon. Um, I tried to start a campaign and received an error message that I wasn't qualified. Why would that be? Um, I, I'm not sure why that would be. As, that's not an error message that I am familiar with. What I would recommend is if you're able to like get a screenshot of that error message, um, send that to our support team because there may be some uh, something that you've encountered that I'm not familiar with. Um, you should be able to start a campaign. Um, but yeah, go to support at mightycause.com. Uh, that shouldn't happen to you, but uh, certainly let us know and we'll help you get that sorted out and understand why that is. And, and just as a tip, anytime you can provide a screenshot of the error message you're getting, that's a huge help to our team. Um, uh, that one, I don't know the particular um, answer to. Oh, and there's one more question. Um, every time the topic of peer-to-peer -peer comes up, 
I blank out. I don't get it. Do I have to find people for peer-to-peer -peer or how are they identified? Um, so peer-to-peer, -peer, um, it sounds more complicated than it is. Um, Peer-to-peer, -peer, you, yeah, you're basically going to have to recruit people. Um, sometimes they'll come to you, like maybe we have some really awesome people on the platform who every year they just start a fundraiser for a charity for their birthday and they pick up, they, they pick the charity and they do it on their own. So in those cases, it can be passive, but when we're talking about a peer-to-peer -peer campaign like events or teams, um, it would be something that you would run yourself at your nonprofit and you would recruit people to be part of your event or part of your team. And then fundraising for your organization is kind of part of the requirement of being a participant. Um, so how you would find the people, um, like I was saying earlier in uh, response to another question, is look at your inner circle. So a lot of nonprofits already have a large team of people who are probably very willing to fundraise for them in your board of directors. Um, definitely tap your board of directors for fundraising. That is one of their responsibilities to your nonprofit is the financial health of your organization. So talk to your board. Um, your volunteers are also a really motivated base of people um, who are often more than happy to fundraise for you. It's just kind of an extension of their volunteer work for your organization. So um, if you don't know who else to ask, uh, you know, your board, your volunteers, and if you have any staff. Um, a lot of times your staff are you know, the best advocates for your cause um, and they love your organization and they work for your organization every day. So if you have any staff members, you can ask them to participate in a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. Um, but otherwise you would be reaching out to your base of supporters, like through an email, through your website, through social media, and just asking them to participate. So it is a proactive process instead of a passive process. Um, so that's uh, kind of what we're talking about here. What they would do is they would sign up, join your team, join your event, or start a fundraiser, and then they would sort of uh, own their particular fundraiser for your organization, and they would go to their family, their friends, everybody that they know on social media and say, hey, I'm fundraising for this fantastic cause. Please go here to make a donation. So um, there is some organizing on the back end and then you, 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 would, you would be the person or the organization to actually reach out and say, hey, we're looking for, for people to fundraise for us for our campaign. Um, so I hope that helps and I'll make sure that you have access to the slides um, so that you can review that. I, I'm sorry if I glanced over um, what peer-to-peer -peer actually is, but yeah, you would be responsible for recruiting and keeping in communication with those fundraisers. Um, but there are some that can crop up organically, um, but again, because it's organic and it's somebody making a decision to start a fundraiser, you don't really have much control, so there's not a whole lot of usefulness there in terms of running a campaign. Um, but I hope that helps, and if you have any other questions, you you can certainly reach out to me and I'm happy to explain it one-on-one. -on -one. And then there's, okay, there's two more questions. Uh, one more question, sorry about that. Um, when creating a team, will the peer-to-peer -peer organizations have access to the daily running totals independently? Thank you. Um, so yeah, they will have some access. So the team organizer, um, if, that, if that's you, they won't be able to access any team, team uh, information, but in an event, for instance, where you have multiple teams, uh, the person who sets up that team that's part of your event will have access to all of their team's information and a basic donation report that shows who made a donation, how much it was for, et cetera, um, which is actually really helpful because they can sort of help you sort out um, questions about like, you know, who was this donation for, what was this intended for, and can sort of take the lead on uh, offering support for the individual donations for their team. So team leaders, the people who own the team page, do have access to that. Um, and then peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers do have a basic donation report where they can say who, they can see who made a donation, what their email address was, and how much the donation was for. Um, we haven't had any issues with that being a problem, um, but they do have access to some basic donor information. And in most cases, the people who are donating are people that they know. So they just know that their Aunt Cindy made a donation to their their peer-to-peer -peer page. So they do have a limited access to uh, donor information. It's not anywhere near as extensive as you would have on your organization profile um, as the administrator for your nonprofit. But yeah, they do have some access to a report. 
All right. Well, thank you. That was a really lively Q&A session. I really appreciate everybody who stuck around for that. Um, I will send out the recording and the slides. Um, and again, my email address is Linda, L-I-N-D-A, at MightyCause.com. If you'd like to reach out to me about any of the content that was in this webinar, um, thank you guys so much for uh, attending this webinar, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.